This is a fun topic, and um, the title of my talk is Robotic Total Joint Arthroplasty. Is it the savior of joint replacement or a technology without a home? Like all provocative to, uh, titles, the answer is somewhere in between there. So um, I do not have any financial disclosures pertinent to this talk, but I am willing to talk about some if you guys want to engage in some. Um, just a little bit about me. In training, we did not have a lot of technology. We did not have robots. We did not have computer navigation. We did not have computer templating. We had to go down to the records room, get the old-fashioned films, and bring them up to the OR so we could use the old-fashioned stencils. In fellowship, it was a lot of technology. We had the manual instrumentation, but we also had a Mako robot. This was right after they came out. A generous donor donated one to the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix. Um, so I did about half of my knees in fellowship uh, with the Mako and half without. Um, and then none of my attendings liked it for the hips. So I would, there's one sports guy that would use it for his hips and I would go and do some hips with him. So I did some hips with, with him in fellowship. In practice, I use, I do not use a robot at all for my hips. Um, in my knees, I do about 50% of my cases at a hospital that does not have a robot. And then I go to a hospital that has a Mako, and then Mercy has a Rosa, but is getting a Mako. And that so I would probably have 20 to 40 percent of my knees that I do robotically at this point. So what's the sales pitch for a robotic total joint? Uh, I started to see this argument come up in conferences, and they state that um, it's like a pitcher, a surgeon's like a pitcher in command of the game. And if you've got a Nolan Ryan or a Randy Johnson, you're great. But what do you do for the rest of them? And they say, well, the robot can take this, this guy a little overweight and kind of some cut off shorts, the bucket of balls, and he can just drop the ball in and he can get a professional pitch every time using, using a machine. And you can take this guy on the left and turn him into the burn smashing World Series winning Randy Johnson on the right, just if you invest a little bit of money on technology. The question is, is that, is that true? Um, well, some things that have been talked about are better accuracy and precision with the robot. Maybe it can protect the soft tissue. And the sales pitch will be that that, that fixes the 20% possible dissatisfaction rate in knee replacement, and it solves the dislocation problem in total hip replacements. So that's the sale. But does it hold? Can you simply drop a person into a machine and pop out a perfect total knee replacement every time? So let's talk a little bit about what is robotic joint replacement how does it work what are the advantages disadvantages and then let's look at the data and say is it is it true so there's some definitions what is a robotic total knee replacement um, well you have manual instrumentation which is using measurement devices to measure distances and rotations in order to make your surgical decisions and to make your cuts to obtain a, a balanced knee or a hip in a, the correct alignment. That's different than a custom instrumentation where you use usually 3D imaging beforehand to plan your case using computers to measure the distances and the rotations and to plan it beforehand. So during surgery, you can snap the instrumentation onto the patient specific anatomy and make your cut. So you're using the computer to do your measuring or you have computer navigation that instead of making a custom instrument, you can simply use the computer in real time to do your measuring, to guide your cuts, but you're still making the cuts. And then there's things like augmented reality, where you can wear a visual helmet of some sort, and then you it, it adds, you can do computer measuring, and it can add visualizations such as three-dimensional imaging overlied with the patient, but you're still using manual instrumentation to make your cuts and to place your hip. So the difference between those technologies and robotic joint replacement is that when you use a robot, the computer's programmed to complete a task. It's not just measuring, but it will do something. That's called haptics. So the definition of haptics is the use of an electronically or mechanically generated movement. So that's the key, is the robot's doing some sort of movement to help you place either a pin block, as in the case with um, the robot at Mercy, or move a mechanical arm that has a saw or a burr, um, as is the case with the other big one, um, or the 
other companies have handhelds that but the the key for a robot is that there's something that the computer can adjust manually while you're cutting to keep you in plane to turn off the the device when you go out of bounds something it, it adds some sort of a haptic sensor well how does this work well the first thing that you need to do whenever you are um doing a joint replacement is you need to build a model and establish a target so in general, we talk about the limb alignment, the flexion gap, the extension gap, and the orientation of the joint. So when you use manual instrumentations, you have a model. You put it in your head. And you're thinking about these things as you're doing the joint replacement, at least you should. And you establish your alignment using extramedullary or intermedullary alignment rods up the femur, up the, down the tibia. Then you use uh, calipers and protractors that are built in to the system to measure and adjust your cuts so that you can establish your goals of having a good limb alignment with um, good flexion extension gaps, whatever your goals may be. And that's not clear what goals we should use. You can talk about posterior stabilized, cruciate retaining. You can talk about medial congruent. Those are all hotly talked about right now. You can talk about um, the anatomic alignment, kinematic alignment. You can change the joint line so it's parallel to the floor, which is probably the most common. So we don't, we have lots of different targets and then there's different ways of achieving those those targets with manual instrumentation so with the robot usually you have to build that model inside the row inside the computer so it knows where the limb is in space and then you can make your adjustments so to go through that a little bit the way you do that is you need to have some way of telling the computer where the bone is in space so the first step that most systems use is some sort of an optical tracker in um, you usually have to screw and make extra extra holes in the bones, oftentimes new incisions, so that the computer can see the limb. Then you have to tell the computer where is that limb. So there's um, a probe of some sort that also has an optical tracker, and you point to landmarks, and you can establish where the joint is in space. So if you're going to build a model with a, a, an imageless system, because you, you just have to teach it where the points are. So usually you can rotate the hip and it, the computer can see the, the optical tracker and calculate the hip center. Then you take your probe and you touch the entry point for your drill and you've established the mechanical axis of the femur. You do the same for the tibia. You touch the entry point uh, between the tibial spines with your probe and your medial and your lateral malleolus and you've got the mechanical axis of the tibia. Then you come in and you use your probe and you touch different landmarks. You can touch the white size line. You can touch the medial and lateral epicondyles. And then you touch the cartilage, usually the um, cartilage and flexion and extension of both the medial and the lateral sides. So that tells the computer where the femur is in space. And you do the same for the tibia. You just touch the cartilage surfaces and you know where the joint line is. Um, finally, you finish your model by the computer can then add in a virtual implant and you know where you're going to make your cuts then you can bring in your computer arm and you can either place a cut block or you can bring in a burr or you can bring in the saw and you can cut um, you have a decision to make once you've registered this are you going to use the computer to do measured resection where you just take the de defined amount of bone from the distal femur from the proximal tibia or are you going to use gap balancing and i would argue if you do not have imaging the robot can be no better than manual instrumentations for for gap, for a measured resection because they're both based on your points. Where do you put your drill um, to start your alignment rod for your femur? That's the same point that you place with the computerized probe. So with, with if you do not have imaging and you're going to use the robot and you're going to use measured resection, I would argue that I can't see how it's more accurate than um, manual instrumentation. So in this case. Garbage in equals garbage out to take some terms from my computer science classes back in the day. So I think that you can get some advantage or potential advantage when you're talking about gap balancing. This is what most guys that are using the robot are going to gap balance. And so what you can do is you can register your, your robot and then you can stress your knee in flexion and extension. Then the robot captures the distance between the proposed cuts and they define that as your ligament tension in um, when it's stressed. You record those gaps on the computer screen. 
Then you do the same thing. You get the medial side. And now you understand where your gaps are before you make cuts. And then you need to, get, to balance it. So it's fairly straightforward. If you look, I like to do my extension gap first. So it looks like the, the cut is going to put the patient into a little bit of varus. So I'm going to take less of the varus tibia, balance my gaps. I know that my implant is going to be 19 millimeters thick, 10 on the tibial side, 9 on the, the femoral side. So I'm shooting for an extension gap of 19. Um, then, I, then I look at my flexion gap, and I see that it's, it's off. So I can rotate the femur, externally rotate it to even up my flexion gap. And, but it's tight in flexion. So I just shift my implant anteriorly and I should have a balanced gap. And then I can bring my robot in, make my cuts, throw my trials in. And this seems to work quite well. So um, the reason why this helps with accuracy without an image is that really you're just relying on the tension between and the ligament length with respect to your proposed cuts. The robot knows exactly where those are. Even if you have bad points, you, you will make parallel cuts and you will make a balanced knee um, because the imageless robot with gap balancing measures the length of the ligament when it's stressed with respect to the virtual cuts. And it knows exactly where those are in space. It will produce the balanced knee. However, if you give it garbage points and you adjust things weird, you can have a joint line that's higher or lower, and you can rotate the joint in weird ways, but it's just the tool you use, garbage in, garbage out. But your knee will be balanced. So there's surgeon-controlled variables in the robot. There's the placement of the registration points, the force applied to the tension of the ligaments, and adjustment to the preoperative plan. All of those affect your outcomes. So adding imaging can increase or can, can change the way you do things a little bit. So a lot of systems and navigation will use three-dimensional imaging, a 3D CT, and they'll build a three-dimensional model. And it has some advantages. When you register your robot with a 3D model, you register it, um, the, the computer can see if your points are good or not. It can validate and see if you're getting good points or not. And if you're not taking good points that match up to the three-dimensional model that it already has from the CT scan, it can reject your registration as a safety check. That way, um, it can help you from putting the joint in a strange alignment. Uh, disadvantages to this are it's more expensive. You have to, the patient's insurance has to pay for a CT scan. There's more planning time because you have to be able to get the CT scan. Now, the turnaround time's fast. I'm doing a robot first case today, and there was issues getting the CT. She got it yesterday morning, and we're good to go. So you don't need a lot of time. Um, there's more planning to obtain the imaging. Uh, is what I just talked about. And then the radiation exposure to the patient, which it's a CT scan of the entire leg so they can get the alignment of everything. So there are non-surgeon human factors in these steps. So you notice that when you get the CT scan, the patient has to lie still. You can get some artifact. The techs have to do the correct protocols. Um, usually this is fairly consistent, but we've all seen CT scans that are less than perfect. The next step in image guided robotics is you have to segment the model. And this is done, usually the company wants to do this. So they'll have a tech and their computer systems that and um, their algorithms that try to tell the computer where the bone is and where the soft tissue is. So they strip out the soft tissue. Most of us are used to doing to seeing these. Um, in residency, I know I had, we had 3D models when you had bad fractures, and it's helpful, um, but there are issues, especially with soft bone. The algorithms that generate these 3D models use just the, the difference in the signal of each individual pixel or voxel on the CT scan. So in the patafocele area, when you have really soft bones, sometimes the density of the bone is not much different than the soft tissue, and it can throw off some of the the segmentation. Sometimes you can have a trauma and then it can, the healed bone and the hardware can throw it off. And the implant company's solution to this is if the CT scan's not good, they just reject it and tell you you need a different CT scan or that you can't use the robot. Or that, that you have to be careful. I've had one case that was post-traumatic where I really wanted to use the robot because the canal was obliterated and the CT scan was questionable. And they, they told me that 
they couldn't verify that the CT scan was good enough. I looked at it, it looked good enough. I used it, the patient did fine. So the next step is that once you've got a 3D model, a human has to go through and verify the plan. You have to mark the landmarks. They can have some computer algorithms, but typically there's a technician on from the implant company that's going through and marking your epicondyles, marking your tibial tubercle, marking where these landmarks are, the distal bone surface so that they can see how much bone you're going to take. So there's a manual component to this. Uh, in my fellowship, we were taught to look at it yourself and verify everything. And you change things a little bit. Surgeons always change things. Who knows if it made a difference? So there's another human interface there. So you have non-surgeon human variables entering into the robotics that you don't have before. You're entering a technician of the CT scan, somebody that's segmenting the, the um, robot, and then finally the placement of the implants. And these are all air, um, areas where you can introduce air. So the analogy of robots are a simple pitching machine starts to break down. It's not as simple as they'd like you to believe. So question comes up. Well, how close is the initial plan where you're using these robots to the final plan? Less than 5% of, in this study of 300 robotic knees, less than 5% stuck with the initial plan. So 95% of the time, you're gonna change the plan during the surgery. And that's, that's not too surprising, we're gap balancing. The robot does not know anything about soft tissue going into the surgery. And it's not until you measure it that you can adjust your plan. So is the robotic knee replacement similar to a pitching machine? Does it turn the dumpy athletic coach into Randy Johnson? And no, it's a lot more complex than that. There's a lot more people touching the patient through the technology. You have more non-surgical hands involved in the planning and carrying out of the plan. Uh, ultimately, this it does rely on the surgeon. So if you don't know what you're doing, and you don't know your tool, you can have a bad outcome. So my, my fellowship director would remind me that his first time using the robot, the cuts were so bad that he had to get the revision instrumentation out and he aborted the robot and had to put augments on the posterior femur. So garbage in, garbage out. You, you need to know your tool. So some people will argue the advantages of the robot is you can set the haptic control to only cut the bone and to have a millimeter of buffer so that you don't cut the artery, you don't cut the soft tissue. They want to say that there's more accurate cuts that a robot can be more precise than a human, um, that there's less instrumentation because more of it's built into the robot. So your turnover times, they are, you can be faster. And I did see this when I switched to using the robot at Mercy and I took some of the, the tech time out, my, my turnover time decreased. There's less instrumentation to less things to, to sterilize. And then they argue more consistent results and less variability between surgeons. There are disadvantages. There's you're adding more incisions at times or longer incisions. You're adding more. There's pin sites that can get infected. There's pin site fractures that have been reported. One of my first M&Ms in fellowship was a case I was not involved in. The patient was doing great after their robotic knee twisted and fractured through their transcortical pin sites. Um, you can leave in different foreign trackers. And I've seen national meetings where they show their x-rays and they forgot to take some of the track hardware out, which is embarrassing. I don't know why they'd ever show that on a national meeting. There's, in general, it slows you down. Um, I've been doing a lot of robotic knees and it's at least 15 minutes slower. And we know operative times are related to infection. You have extra people in the room. Usually you'll have a rep and you'll have somebody running the robot. So can that increase the risk of infection? And it's a new tool with a learning curve. I think the data that I was, some people say it only takes 10 to 11 cases until you're up to speed. I would think that's probably reasonable. And then there's a loss of manual skills and knowledge. I think, um, think of a cemented hip and how many of the young guys coming out have done a lot of cemented hips. And there's, I think we're going to lose some of the, the knowledge and skills of the manual instrumentation if we're not careful. So that's nice. That's a lot of opinion. What do the data show? So let's talk about hips and dislocations. So this is a case that I've inherited. Um, if anybody wants to help, I'd be I'd gladly let them be involved. Um, she's had multiple dislocations after a metal on metal hip. She has no abductors, there's no greater trochanter. 
And this is, she had this attempt at Mayo and then again at St. Joe's. And I don't think that this hip is salvageable at this point. So um, dislocation risk this is a, a paper from 2018. And um, it was interesting. They said that this is for posterior hips using the robot that in their study, they found that it was 20% more accurate of putting the cup in the safe zone, yet they had more dislocations. And when you looked at the robotic acetabular placement, they were shooting for 40 degrees of inclination and 20 degrees of anaversion. The robot had 40 degrees of in inclination. So it was right on, it was accurate, and it was um, very precise with a range of only of three degrees. But the surgeons weren't that far off. They were putting the cup on average at 42 degrees and with a range of about five. So we're talking about a, a, just a couple degrees difference in this study, but it was significantly stati or statistically significant. I don't know that it's clinically significant, um, but they couldn't make the same claim for the antiversion because the antiversion was, didn't hit their goal. Their goal was 20 degrees of antiversion. The robot did a little better at 16.7. And the surgeon put it in at 13.3. So in this study, which one of the problems with this study is that they're outside the ranges either way. This was done with RoboDoc, which was the first robotic hip done. It's a more, um, it's not so much an assisted arm like I've talked about. It was fully automated. And it was interesting that um, they had 5% dislocation rate in their robotic group and a 1.4% dislocation rate in their control group. Now they attributed it to falls. And so they, they said that you know, maybe it's not so much um, the robot's fault, the patients were falling. And so they had, that's why they dislocated more. So that was the first kind of study that came out in the first robotic hips. So I tried to see, well, what's, what's recently been reported? And this was a review from 2023. Journal of Joint Surgery and Research. I don't know that journal very well, um, but they had some um, data that I thought was interesting talking about dislocation, reasons for hip dislocations. And I think that these are important. The things they did see is that inexperience is a reason for dislocation. And that for every 10 joints that a surgeon, a hip surgeon does a year, the dislocation rate is reduced 50%. So if you're doing 10 joints and you have a high dislocation rate, if you do 20, 30, 40, 50, 150, like most of us are doing, you're going to get better at it and you're going to have less dislocations. Um, again, experience, if you take a long time in the OR, which the authors argue was probably experience, if you're taking more than two hours for a hip, the dislocation rate was almost 5%. If you get that OR time to less than 90 minutes, that dislocation rate went down to 3.6. They talk about the cup size, that a large cup, if you're using greater than size 56 outer diameter, you have a higher rate of dislocation than a smaller hip. And the thought is that maybe there's more volume in the capsule to allow more play and you may dislocate more. The uh, head size, the bigger is better. Dual mobility, um, big heads, they can help decrease the dislocation risk. And that's another problem with these papers is as we switch to larger heads, the rates, a 5% dislocation rate just seems so foreign to us that we just don't see that anymore. Um, so there's a paper that out of 10,000 hips, they had 206 dislocations, 58% of those were in the safe zone. So that statistic there kind of challenges the notion that a, ro a robot, if it's been shown to put the hip, the cup in, in the correct space every time, it's still not stopping dislocations. Other reasons for dislocation are hip impingement, insufficient offset, which causes hip impingement. Poly wear with time can cause increased laxity and uh, dislocations. And they, the review of the, the literature, the intraoperative fluoroscopy does not seem to help cut placement during um, the surgical approach. Another study, this one was um, in another obscure journal, but... Um, this one's trying to look at outcomes and they were saying that it might be more safe that you may have your limb length may be more accurate but they didn't see any difference in survivorship or complications when they looked at the data uh, here's another one from surgical technology international 2017 this was a single 
study. It's been quoted by multiple of the review articles. And um, it was a single surgeon study. He looked at his first 100 hips, then his last 100 before he started using a robot. He had a 5% dislocation rate and only 30% were placed in the safe zone. Then the late, he improved as he got more experience with 3% dislocation and 45 were placed in the safe zone. Then he started using the robot and he had 77% placed in the safe zone and he hadn't had any dislocations in two years, but it didn't give the number. So for that surgeon, the robot seems to have made a difference. Um, the next study, this was in the Journal of Arthroplasty. The data is better. Uh, it was a single institution study with uh, like 1,200 hips. About 1,700 were robotic, 3,000 with navigation in the manual were about 8,000. And they noticed that the dislocation rates, were, these numbers were the first time that I actually saw numbers that seemed reasonable. So the dislocation rate for their manual, they had 51 out of 8,000 for a rate of 0.6% were dislocating with their manual. And with their robot, they had 0.1%. So that was statistically significant. For that institution, um, using a posterior approach, they had a statistically significant decrease in dislocations. That's one of the only papers I've, I was able to find that showed a dislocation with modern dislocation rates that would suggest they're using large heads. So with that data, um, if you have a dislocation rate between three and 5%, a robot might help you, um, but that's not normal. If you have that high, you should be looking for a reason for why you're dislocating. Um, so I don't use robots for my hips and I'm not, after reviewing the literature, I'm not gonna start using them for my hips. I don't, I've had one dislocation and just like any surgeon, I have good excuses. This was a guy that went back to work the day after surgery as a pool maintenance man. I'd purposely try to over anavert the cup and he decided that it felt good to stretch by hanging his leg off the bed and externally rotating it. And he was able to pop it out. I put it back in and he's done great. And he's several years out, no dislocations, loving it. The incision that you have to make with to register the bone is bigger, so it's more invasive, and you have to put tracking pins. When you go anterior, they go through the contralateral iliac crest, so I think that can introduce pain, and it's more incisions, more places for infection, more possible fractures, and it takes more time. And if the reason that you're using a robot is to decrease the dislocation rate, and your dislocation rate is lower than the reported robot dislocation rate, I'm going to stick with my manual instrumentation for my hips. Let's talk about knees. Um, this is a case I did with the robot because um, I didn't know what the canal was going to be and I knew there was deformity. This was the case I mentioned earlier where the CT scan was less than ideal. So the data, now this is RoboDoc, that first uh, robot showed there was no better outcomes and they actually had higher infection rates. They did see using it for the uni that they had a lower revision rate of 2.6 versus a 5% revision rate at three years, but that's a uni. Journal of Arthroplasty in 2022, um, no difference in patient reported outcomes. 2018, International Orthopedics equivalent outcomes. 2021, systemic review and meta-analysis. Um, that was in Bone and Joint Journal. No difference in short or midterm follow-up. There is no long-term follow-up because these robots have not been long, long enough. They concluded after their systemic review that there's an absence of high-quality data. 2021, another systemic review meta-analysis, knee sports trauma arthroscopy. So it's a, an obscure journal. Again, they didn't. They said more accurate placement, but they didn't have any significant patient-recorded outcomes. And they said their studies that they used were low quality. 2022 Journal of Arthroplasty. Um, alignment might be better. That's been shown that the robot might be more accurate, might be more precise. But there aren't really any data that show that the patient reported outcomes are any better. And the, the, the studies that they reviewed, they, the increases in the patient reported outcomes were not clinically significant, even if they were statistically significant. 2023, this is another strange, obscure journal. Again, they said the x-rays looked better, but the clinical outcomes are inconclusive. So um, there's a lot of poorly done studies out there, and there's just not, we haven't had a long, 
long enough to see clinical differences. So um, my conclusion in reviewing the literature for the total knee is, yeah, your post-op might hit the target better, but we don't know what the target should be. Um, does hitting our target affect the outcome? Well, let's talk about where I think that the robots can help us in the future. So we talk, I kept talking about the target. And in hips, we, we can see that we can put the cup right smack dab in the middle of the, the safe zone every time, but it hasn't affected dislocation rates. But I think it did help us a lot because I think as surgeons, we like to blame ourselves. But maybe it's not that it, we're not accurate enough to put it in the right place. Maybe we're hitting the wrong target. So instead of trying to hit the safe zone every time, maybe we need to put it in the functional alignment. The role of the spinal pelvic association seems to have a much greater effect on dislocation rates than using a robot or not. But I think that when I interviewed for fellowship at ISK and NYU in their combined program, I was talking to one of their attendings who had been using robotics. And he basically said, the robot's shown us that it doesn't affect dislocation rates, but we're starting to look at the spine now because it's, we can't blame ourselves anymore. So I, I do think I attribute the robot to the discovery of the spinal pelvic association and the role of that with dislocation. Um, I think with the knees, as we can better measure and record our data, I think we're going to find that we need to, how much do you tension the ligaments? Do you tension it the same for a 50-year-old male as you do for a 90-year-old woman? I don't think so. So as we can stop blaming ourselves for poor cuts, I think that um, it's going to teach us, as we use it as a research tool, we can have accurate placement every time and stop, place, stop placing blame on the placement and start figuring out, should we be putting these in kinematic alignment? Should we be um, gap balancing? What, what should the target be? Do we need to correct the limb alignment to, to zero, or do we want to leave them in a couple degrees of varus? Um, I think moving forward, there, there is a study that concerns me. This was in the Journal of Arthroplasty this year. It's recent. And um, it was a survey, so take that for what it's worth, but it was of senior residents. They had 222 senior residents re uh, respond. So that's, that's about a fourth. So 20% of those said that half of their knees were robotic in, in residency and training, and that those that did more robotic knees were less comfortable with manual instrumentation. And that makes sense. If you don't do it as much, you're not going to be as familiar with the tool. And um, another uh, concerning trend is that residents that had gone to an industry-sponsored course had a stronger belief that the robot improved outcomes, despite not having a lot of data that shows that they do. So um, I think robots are here to stay. Hospitals have invested in them. I think there is utility in using them, especially as a research tool. I like it. It's a fun technology, um, and I it doesn't make my patients worse. I put all my tracking within the incision, so I don't. When I'm in follow up, I I have to ask the patient where they had their knee done to be able to know if it was a robot or not, unless I have the X-ray, and I don't see a difference um, just with observational data between my outcomes when I use it or my outcomes when I don't. Um, thank you. Um, what questions do we have?